Yeah. So um, are we going to um, get to 7.3? Because I know we've covered all the way up to page 99 and then we, we kind of took a break, but I think we actually did cover this in some form or fashion. So do we want to just uh, forge ahead or like, do you have anything that you want to discuss on page 99? Um, what else was there? Um, so we're just talking about the, um, the medium absolute deviation. Um, Correct. Correct. Yeah, estimated difference is the same as regressing on indicator area. Didn't quite understand that, but never mind. Oh, and that's about it. Yeah, exactly. Not situation. Yeah, no, I, I think that's pretty fine. I, the rest of it's just kind of like implementation of the theory after that, isn't it? Um, so, um, it's kind of cool that Kevin actually got to use uh, Stan GLM. I'm like, wow, that's that's really cool. I um, started using fake data myself the other day. Have you really? Yeah, but not, but just in order to just for dashboarding. Ah, for um, so it's because I couldn't be bothered to do lots of data pools. So what I did was one data pool on a small subset, and then just uh, ver then just ah. added some noise into the data. Gotcha. <laughs> Which I stole from here. It's actually really, really useful when you um, when you just need um, to replicate something several times and say, "Oh, well, well, the filtering system works." Yeah, yeah. They're so not as good as using actually using Stan, but yeah. So I have a question for you. What does it mean that um, estimating the mean is the same as regressing on a constant term? Like, why? How? Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so let's just think about this. If you're estimating the mean, um, let's just see how I do this. Um, I see what they've done here all the way down there. They're saying that you can estimate the mean of the population as a, a, the mean term, of course. So you get that, and then you get an estimate of 3.3 .3 as your mean and a standard error of 1.1. But if you did, if you did use your, le if you constructed your least squares regression uh, on a constant term where you have the y underscore or not, which is your, which is your pop, which is which are those popular, I mean, which is your 10, 20 observations, I guess. Hmm. But if you use a constant on your x, so instead of your the independent variables, instead of using any of those, you actually use a one, which is a constant, then presumably you get the same. That's interesting. Least class regression on an indicator is the same as computing a difference in means. A difference in means. What does that mean, difference in means? Least class regression on an indicator. It's on this on the next page, um, August on page 100, mm. right on top, least class regression on an indicator is the same as computing a difference in the means. So you have y naught, which is equal to. Let's have a look. Um, it might be easier to just knit this document and then I can just see it. Point three is your intercept, obviously. Oh no. Oh. Estimate of 3.3 and a standard error of 1.1. Assign a sign of flat prior, so we'll produce a classical least squares regression estimate. We discover we discuss prior distributions mode in section 9.5 between the simple average and the intercept only regression. In practice, the equivalence between the simple average and the intercept only regression. So, in other words, if uh, you had no x and you only had a constant, which means that you only want the intercept term then supposedly that would be equivalent to have to computing the simple average on a distribution or a simulation. Sorry, repeat that. So if you had an, if you had an intercept only regression, in other words, you don't have any independent variables, you have your outcome variable and you're regressing it on uh, on a constant term, which in other words would mean that you only want the intercept. Mm. 
then mm-hmm. that what you would get from that the metrics you would get from that is apparently equivalent with a simple average for that distribution so in other words when they just compute the mean and the standard dv and the standard error of the of of that particular uh, r norm by they have a mean of 2 and a standard deviation of 5 they get 3.3 and 1.1 for the mean and the standard error and that's exactly the same thing that they get when they regress on a constant intercept term and they don't have any independent variables so we know that the true intercept for this regression is 2.0 and the residual standard deviation is 5 but the small sample size yields noisy estimates estimates of 3.3 and 5.3 are consistent with the two parameter values given the standard errors of the fit Mm. It's been a long time since I read this chapter. This is uh, yeah. this doesn't sit in my head. <laughs> Estimating a difference is the same as regressing on an indicator value. Can directly compute the averages in each group and compute the corresponding standard error. So. Y minus Y not. I don't know what Y not here is. Actually, if I mean of Y underscore not, what is Y underscore? Oh. I'm struggling with this now as to what. Um, it kind of reminds me of the formula that I used to learn in like my school statistics class, where the slope used to be defined as y1 minus y not, where, but that was those were two means from point A to point B. Like you could calculate the slope of your line that way. Mm-hmm. However, here I'm not sure if it's uh, here. It's not the. the y bar is actually your mean isn't it it's not a, it's not an observation the y1 bar minus y0 bar is but here it's actually the means whereas i i only remember like when i used to learn when i learned statistics in school we had um you know one value of y minus another over you know the rise over the run so you could you could if you had two points you would compute the difference between the y divided over the difference of the x mm. and that would give you the slope and this is basically the estimate of the slope is identical to the difference in means as it must be for the simple model and that's basically what they're saying is estimating a difference estimating a difference is the same as regressing on an indicator variable so um the regression on an indicator variable and the comparison of the two means the least squares line will go through the points so that the slope of the line is simply the difference between the the means of the two you know oh okay right yeah so what they're saying is basically when you've got two groups and you split the, you've got two basically two distributions um and that when you're comparing two two on a regression essentially the difference is just the difference between the two means so the 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 actual slope of the line is just that difference that's right so what is it where are you regressing on an indicator what is the which which is the indicator variable that you are regressing on um well it can be anything but like um 
so in this example here, um, let's call, uh, I mean, they like to use politics, so we'll stick with the politics example. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say that zero is Republican because they're older, and then Y is, sorry, mm -hmm. one is like Democrats because they're in more mm -hmm. numerous number. Um, uh, and so the population here is kind of like, um, so the population here, here's our mean right at center, and then here's our mean here. Now, if we regress across here to say, um, if we were using regression to say a zero value is this mean, mm -hmm. and if we use the one regression value point and say a one or an increase by whatever the uh, indicator is, Correct. Um, then the difference between the two is the a coefficient of the regression line but that's actually just you see the two points the uh, two uh, dotted lines those are your two means and so the slope of the slope of the beta coefficient is exactly the same as um the, the difference of the means. difference between the two points when you've got just like say a simple difference there so when it's constant um like as this is then but the thing is, is that true for a, any data set that if you had two groups and you could compute the mean of uh, those observations and then if you regressed on um, what, so the, the, that equation, y uh, 3.3 plus 4.2x, what, so, the regression on an indicator variable shown by the fitted line and the comparison of the two means shown by the difference between the two dotted lines. Mm -hmm. So which is the fitted line and which is the difference between the two dotted lines though? This is the fitted line. Correct. And, and what the, is the difference between the two dotted lines? It's exactly the same. It's the same line, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's just this plus 5.8. So, but wait, so, how did the dotted lines come come to existence? Because uh, that is the line of that is the mean for each one of those uh, data sets, correct? I mean, the two zeros and zero and one, that is the center point for the data there. Okay, I see. Yeah. So is this true for like anything that the difference in mean, the regression on indicator, and the comparison of the two means should be equivalent? So. What does this what does this even mean in the large scale large scheme of things? To express comparisons as regressions, we need the concept of an indicator variable. So, in other words, you can't just um, have the means of your two data sets and and just compute the just um, I mean, like, okay, let's say that we don't know the concept of regression at all, okay, and we had like two populations, like you said, Democrat and Republican. Mm -hmm. And we just go in and we get the, we have all of these data sets already, I mean, data points already recorded. So we get the mean of both. And then we get the midpoint of your zero, we get the midpoint of one, and then we draw that line. So we actually get the regression line. So what is regression? It's nothing but a comparison, right? Like it's, it's basic, it's essentially a comparison, but we need the concept of an indicator variable. I think it's different. Um, I, I think regression is, um more like uh, 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 explained explained variance, whereas um, when we're talking about difference, we're talking like say an ANOVA. An ANOVA is a prime example of difference, and there it, an ANOVA basically takes use of regression in a way <laughs> that this actually explains here. It, uh, you know, this you know could essentially be an ANOVA, which is is there a statistical difference between group one and group two. If we right. look at contrast coding, then the answer would be yes. There will be a statistical difference. Um, but the ANOVA doesn't take account of the slope of the line. All it does is put, well, it does uh, in the background, but realistically speaking, all it's doing is picking out the difference between the two groups. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so, what am I trying to say? Oh, God. So, the point of doing all this using fake data simulation is to directly check that the direct comparison of your two means and the mm. regression gives us the same answer. Yes, which so, uh, it does, yeah. 
So you're, when you say you're regressing for, and let's go with your original example where zero represents Republicans and one represents the Democrats. So if you were trying to explain that particular thing as in, 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 in the regression jargon, like what would you say you were trying to establish the correlation between uh, let's say you... uh, the impact of um, of opi- uh, strength of opinion about a policy. Say, hey, okay, so mm. uh, let's say government spending, because <laughs> everyone likes to talk about that. Um, so let's say um, mm. the Democrats are more pro in favour, so they'll be more likely to rate uh, rate uh, more government spending higher and the democrats be more likely to rate more government spending lower um which i think probably ties up with those ideas but those kind of political philosophies a bit better so in other words your why is actually representing like uh like like what where where each of the parties stand in terms of their opinion on uh government spending like and, yeah, and... but you, you you could take this to a more to an easier place rather than think about politics. Let's uh, give our example. Um, let's say um, people who studied music and didn't, <clears throat> and the amount of money that they spend on mu- on music. Um, so, um, mm-hmm. I, I, and the y axis can be anything, uh, but I mean, mm-hmm. like ignoring their y axis and just say, well, one are people who studied music at university and zero people who didn't and then mm-hmm. people who didn't have uh still spend money on music because they still like music but they don't like it as m- but they don't spend quite as much as people who study music because those people so then why is your cost then so in other words why are you what you're measuring on the yeah. y-axis is actually your cost okay yeah why is your dependent variable yeah yeah but but uh, you're, you're measuring cost in this particular instance okay yeah in this example yeah yeah okay. so it's just a way of measuring the uh spread of an outcome on two groups or like you know you could use another example which is like say the weight of mice uh, uh, uh one's received a ghrelin injection and the other one hasn't oh so when you say spread of outcome you mean the difference in the means is actually measuring the difference the spread yes. of outcome between the two groups yeah yeah essentially yeah um, because if you look at those two groups, if you if you were to um, see, see this here, it's flat line. If you were to then spread this out, you could spread it out as a distribution pattern instead. See what I mean? I mean like that. No. <laughs> Wait, can I annotate this? Well, Wait, annotate. Yeah, there you go. Right, look like this. When when you compute mm-hmm. the difference of mean on something. Oh. It needed to have been measured on some indicator variable already, correct? It's not like they just happened upon data where they have all of those data points and they don't know what they were measuring. So in other words, when that data was collected, they already knew that they were looking at costs relative to party ideology. So you're, you're already regressing even when you compute your data and you compute the mean of that data, correct? So well, why like make a distinction between actually saying a least squares regression is the same as computing a difference in means because in theory, even when you got all of those data points on zero and one, you were already thinking about zero as being your one party and one being another. Um, And your indicator is nothing but your X, which is whether they belong to the Republican party or the Democratic party, right? Yeah, this so, is this is a grouping variable and this is just a Y. And what they're saying is this variance between, so here's our center point here for this for this one. And here's our center point here for this one. I know, sorry about the distributions, they're not very good. But okay. then this difference here equals this number, which is 5.8. So Republicans, on this scale, as we're calling them, start off at 4.2 in terms of how in favor you go- more government spending, based on our example. And then de- Democrats are slightly higher on 10. And uh, then so to then the difference between these two distributions is 5.8, which is the same as the beta coefficient. You know, it really kind of blows my mind that what you're really looking at if is is difference in means. I mean, like, what if you had like ten different groups, though? What if you were trying to figure out a regression line for something that has 
sex, gender. So instead of just being like one party or the other, then, I mean, if you had to think about it that way, then, okay, so let's say August, just for argument's sake, I'm trying to, let's say my Y is representing uh, ability to read. This is extremely politically incorrect, but let's just for, just to keep it simple. Y is the ability to read. Zero is uh, male. Uh, okay. Zero is female. One is male, whatever. Okay. So in this case, you have one indicator that is your gender. So if you have to break up a regression model into its constituent units. So like, let's say you want to see the effect of sex and age on reading ability. So your mm -hmm. Y represents your reading ability. Then in theory, this would be two graphs where you would have the midpoint of your first indicator, which would be the sex. And then that difference would give you the beta coefficient for that indicator. And then you have another graph where you would have all of that data with the, the difference in means for when you measured it for your indicator being, um, the um, age and you came up with, I mean, so really you're, you're looking at two experiments where you're measuring for age without taking gender into, comp into account and you're measuring for gender without taking your age into account. And of course there could be interaction terms, they could not, but that's what it is, correct? You're, you're essentially computing the means of those two groups and so that really you becomes your data. But you don't put that on a two-dimensional scale. You put on a three-dimensional one. This that would be a three-dimensional. Um, th so this is where graphs start having problems when you start moving beyond three dimensions or four dimensions. If you look at, like, say, PCA, what it does is it flattens your data. So it takes all your data mm -hmm. and then kind of, like, flattens them into groups. But that multi-dimensional dimensional structure is... Uh, um, I'm making hats. That's nothing but the regression line. Is that what it is then? If you're looking at a PCA, that's basically the regression line that's kind of tying in two different indicators, indicator variables. Is that what it is? And so that's why you have one for each one of your, right? Um, so um, if you have to draw yeah. that, that red thing in, in three dimensions, like for say both age and gender, um then you know what? i i draw it completely differently actually from that um so um let, let's say we're doing age and gender right so we can do it in a completely different way where's the free draw bit uh draw well we could use this i suppose so let's say this is uh age because um what's it called i don't know if you know this but um verbal iq increases with age and does not decline Good to know. Um, and this one would be read uh, yes. reading. Yeah. Right? Let's just now. Uh, now we know that females are actually also better at uh, reading than men, typically speaking. So uh, let's put the men's line below this. So they start off at the same level. Uh, oh no, it's not free draw. Where is it? Is that, was that pretty cool? Yeah. So it starts off at the bottom line. There you go. There's men yeah. we're following around. And then after school, and then men stop reading because they have a bunch of morons. <laughs> <laughs> and then we end up with some gap over here. Right. So, and then this, uh, this so what we have is, um, so th this is our actual data, but I should have just plotted it as lines, right? Correct. Uh, so let's do men on the left and females, uh, males on the left and the females on the right. Uh, but what I'm saying is because age is uh, oh, okay. age is a sequential factor, um, you, you want to draw it a bit differently. So, uh, so it look like this, right? Um, and then okay. we'd have women and I don't know why I've chosen red, let's choose purple. Oh, no, that's too similar cover. Yeah, green. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? right. and, and like you know same kind of thing really but we just got women a bit more dotted higher slightly up a bit more right all right okay so then our regression line for women ends up being like that mm -hmm. and our uh our regression line for men ends up being like that mm -hmm. um right so we then have uh increased by age but we also have this difference here mm -hmm. Uh, caused by uh, caused by the gender factor, and Good. so that if you look at it that way, 
then our difference here, if we if we hold age constant and take a snapshot, say around here, then we could just look at this bit of the distribution, those bits, and that's essentially what you kind of do in a regression. It's like what, what, so when you're looking at the, when you're looking at the co coefficients, you're just holding a section constant. So you're picking out like, for instance, the bit of the mean or the bit of the intercept or something like that. Does that make sense? Right. right. I see. That's what it is, right? You're holding one part of that constant, your X constant. And you're computing the mean of the Y on along that and then the difference of that. Yeah. For that then, indicator at that instance, at that snapshot yeah. of that indicator. But then there's also for every, for instance, unit increase in age, you might say the uh, reading ability goes up, whether you're male or female. Yeah. But because of the effect of being male or female. Yeah. Uh, right. We might say that, the, that there's more of a difference, but then we might then take a look at, like, say, social economic status. Well, say, here's well, the thing, actually, though. if they're both rich, they've got different less. But difference. here's my question to you. So let's say you hold the age constant and then you get one set of values like this. So I do that at age 10. Then I take another set of values where I hold age constant at 11 and I get a set of values of the reading ability. OK, so then how does that essentially translate to a, a coefficient when let's say I have 10 ages across which I've done this and for each I have computed um, a mean? for each value of, uh, of age, and I have 10 ages at the end, and therefore I have 10 difference in means, how mm -hmm. does that translate into an actual coefficient, which can be applied from age 10 through age 20, which was the period for which I got means of my reading ability for both uh, for uh, male and female? How, how, do, how does that happen then? How does that um, get transformed those 10 difference in means actually translate to a coefficient for um, um, the uh, age factor. You know what well, I mean? Well, uh, oh, dear, that's not good. Um, well, oh, that's not good either. Um, oh, I'll just do it anyway. Right. It depends on what we're doing. If we're putting a linear model through like that, um, yeah. then, you know, we've just got, um, we've got our sigma down here, mm -hmm. uh, which is, no, wait, that's wrong. That's A. Um, and then sigma's the bit, you know, how much intolerance it's got. And then so B is this line of slope, which we can think of as this angle here. Oh, I can't draw for the top. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so... <sighs> We just follow along this, if this is age here, we just follow mm -hmm. along this um, and then pick out a number and we times that by whatever value because this slope is just whatever it is and we increase it by value. We haven't added in any other things like polynomials or um, any other. Well, kind of how, does the, how do you get that consolidated beta value? I mean, I know it's happening in the program, but really what the program has done is that it has made the age constant across those 10 age groups and it has gotten the mean of each reading ability at each of those 10 uh, age points. And then that has somehow translated into a regression coefficient for the indicator age, correct? Um, well, in this example here, uh, yeah, let's go to this. Um, in this example here is more like more like an experimental condition rather than because if we, add, if we okay. put age into it, adding two constants together yeah two continuous variables but here we've got uh, what appears to be a continuous and a discrete categorical variable yeah. mm -hmm. so this would be more like I, I, I think experimental design is better here think about it as this is like this group got the placebo this group didn't okay. uh, and this is like um, for instance um, amount of um uh what's it Bit spread uh, in uh, amount of white blood cells for infection group okay. a infection yeah something like that and therefore this this therefore we're saying there's this difference from between these two groups if we add a third group in there like say for instance 
gender as a factor, then we might get um, a slight, mm. another slight difference. But when we do so, we can't look at it like on this level, you know, in this way, because mm -hmm. it doesn't really make sense. We're talking about graphing theory at this point. Which yeah, is yeah. No, no, no. I, I get that. I get that. I, I do. But OK, I guess this will not translate to that because age is a continuous variable. So it's not a discrete binning. So yeah, to your point, that's not going to work because it's not it's not discrete bins, it would be a continuous. So obviously yeah. that would that would be different. So, so this could not really be applied to uh, a continuous variable. If your indicator was continuous, you likely could not do something similar, could you? Because you would have means at every one of the values of X, if you held it constant, you would have mean, you would have a mean for your Y. So I'm not sure if that would work the same way there, if it was continuous, your X. Well, I mean, technically it does. Um... <clears throat> you see here when I was drawing this uh, this distribution, yeah. when we're thinking about like say we've got like say a load of data going across the line and we've got this these dots everywhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, I see. Basically, what we're capturing is uh, we've got uh, we're, we're predicting that it's got Gaussian errors. Yeah, regardless of how much data we have at each individual point. Yeah. Um, so what that means is, um, what that means is that if we had more indicator, if we had more points on this, we'd have this Gaussian distribution each time, wouldn't we? But when we've only got one Gaussian, when we've only Correct. got one, in the, one, yeah. one unit difference between A and B, because if you think about it, this, this kind of indicator variable is just the equivalent of having a zero continuous and a one on the con this other continuous scale. So if you were to say right. this is age zero and this is age one yeah. in terms of reading ability, then actually this one this one difference in with these Gaussian errors is exactly the same. I mean, yeah. It's just that um, that difference uh, doesn't apply so yeah. well when you go further and further on. But if you then did every single one as then one said said you made each one a base so you compare the difference so this is zero to one years of age and then we have over here um say and then we we then transform it and make that zero and one and we just have lots of zero and ones for each age group even though we're going actually one two three like Got that it. then each time we're capturing that difference because we've got this constant um uh, so the difference is what is being plotted as a, as the slope, right? Like, yeah, yeah, essentially, it, and because the slope is constant, and in that, what it means is it just goes, goes through all the lines. It, it technically, it's infinite, right? In a way, hey, from from mathematical from the statistical theory, it's infinite. Um, so because that's constant, that means that every, every, from every level, we've got a difference of zero. So if we're starting up, if our intercept is at this point here, if we keep moving the intercept along, the difference will always be the same because the error terms are always the same and the, and the, um, uh, and the um, angle of the uh, beta, curve, beta uh, line is the same. That makes sense. Correct. I'm no, it makes one. sense. It makes no, no. It makes perfect sense. So that okay. would really be a flat line, like it would have no slope, right? It would be straight. Uh, yeah, essentially. Yeah, it's this is a non-complex model, I would say. Yeah. Not sure if that's the best phrase for such a thing, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. Okay, that so, was quite uh, a segue. Well, we're being good, uh, good order for when we get to multiple, uh, multivariate regression. Multivariate, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so can we just quickly look at uh, what time is it? August. Okay, two fifty. Okay, so let's just uh, like, can you stay till three ten? Like, can you stay for another twenty minutes? Yeah, I don't have a hard stop. It's uh, well past okay. uh, working time. Ah, oh, gotcha. Okay, look, okay. So exercise uh, one, page one hundred one. In the election forecasting sample of section 7.1, we used inflation adjusted growth in an av in average personal and uh, in average personal income as a predictor. From the standpoint of economics, it makes sense to adjust for inflation here. But supposing the model had used growth in average personal income, not adjusting for inflation, how would this have changed the resulting 
regression? How would you change? How would this change have affected the fit and interpretation of the results? So it would inflate. Um, it it would make the beta more uh, a higher value. It would be higher. Yeah, um, yeah. because each change in year you'd have a much higher line you'd so have a higher value yeah. yeah yeah okay that's right okay so okay good okay cool simulate 100 data points from the linear model y is equal to a plus bx plus error and you have the a and b values the values of x being sampled at random from a uniform distribution on the range uh of from 0 to 50 and errors that are normally distributed with mean 0 and standard deviation 3 so your errors are um so that is the mean and standard deviation of your error term. So not of your, um, not of your, um, not of the model itself. Um, so I think this is relatively easy to do. You would have to introduce an error term where the error itself is a, a randomly distributed, uh, it's a random distribution with the mean and the, uh, standard and you would specify the. Yeah, so what we're we doing here, we're doing our norm uh, uh, and then we're doing, um, 100 points, uh, is that uh, right? Is it on? No, yeah, we're doing 100 points, yeah. Mm -hmm. 100, oh, I spelled yeah. wrong. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. this is correct, 100. Um, and then we have the value of the intercept. So I think you would use a stand GLM oh. actually. Uh, and then the R norm would be used for your error term, uh, August. Sorry, what should I be using? I think your, um, your um, Mm, for the model, you would use a stand underscore GLM and there you would specify your Y and your, because there you have the coefficients and the linear intercept oh, given and okay. the intercept given. But I it's think fine. your error term would be a R norm because there you would actually say that you, um, um, your, you, you've been given the mean and the standard deviation of your errors. And then you have the inclusive range of um, zero and 50. I don't know how you would do that in an error term though. Not yeah. quite sure. Um, like this simulation. Um, yeah, I mean that's uh, that's kind of like it's done out during the chapter, really. Um, in fact, didn't we do that lot? Didn't we do something similar like that last the week? Range? Um, not quite sure how the range fits into something like this, but I can try. Um, noise one and noise two, um, 50 and 10. Like I've never seen a range being included. It's more the mean and standard, but then having said that, it doesn't mean that I could have just forgotten which one if. Standard deviation. And then plus sigma A plus um hey, you know what? Um here it is. Um August, if you went to page 82, if hmm. you went to page 82, then um not still still not sure how um yeah, if you included your library stand arm, then you could do the part of code there. So you have the y is equal to b plus uh, um, uh, a plus bx plus sigma, which is going to be your error term, times the r norm, and then that r norm we would specify this. But having said that, um, x and n. Oh, and then you would specify your x because that is your range zero to fifty, and then your n is going to be a hundred data points, correct? So your x is going to be one to fifty. Uh, and this is on page um, 82. Oh, okay. So, um, so X is... Of, the, um, of your textbook, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let's just get this going quickly. Right. So uh, X is, uh, what was it? 150. Yeah. X is 1 to 50. Correct. And N uh, is going to be... Um... No, actually, you know what? Hold on. Um... No, X is actually... Zero to fifty. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Zero to fifty. Uh, N is gonna be um, hundred, right? A is. At least sorry? Is, oh, here it's the length of X. Yeah, but I think it's. Oh, we're doing one hundred. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. The sample size is yeah correct, and then A is gonna be a five, and B is seven.
and then your sigma is um, uh, three. Uh, is three. And then you would, um, I guess you don't need to explicitly say um, mean zero because that's already impl implied in a, for, for your error distribution that it would be a mean zero. So yeah, so then your y is y a plus b times x plus sigma times r norm of n. Sorry, say n. Uh, yeah, so y, a y, an assignment operator, a plus um, a plus b times x. Um, so x is being x being your indicator a plus b times x plus sigma being or sig in your case. Yeah, plus sig times r norm of uh, n. Yeah, I think that should work. But you have included Astan arm, is that right? Uh, uh, I do have it, yeah. Okay. But I haven't put that down. Oh wait, this is this formula is meant to go into uh, to our stand, is it? Well, I yes. Mm -hmm. So then you have to then create a a data frame with it using um. You would then say data or something like that, and then you would say data assignment operator data dot frame of x comma y. Wait a second. One second. Uh, a plus b uh, times x plus. I'll just give me one second, my uh, my boss, one of my bosses just called, I'm just gonna to respond to her. Yeah, no worries. Hey, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Oh, hey, look at that. You did it. Is that you? Is, is that? Oh, wow. Yeah. That, yeah. They um, seem to keep increasing linearly, though. I mean, I guess that's how it should be. Huh? Oh, because your B is going, A, A, X is going up, presumably. So it's going from. 
Well, but if you're sampling a hundred times and it's zero to 50, like that's interesting that, oh, but they're not like all going the same time. Uh, three standard deviations or uh, three or whatever, which I presume has quite a significant impact as a multiplier. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so um, did you want to convert that into a data frame? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, 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 yeah. so you can just do or you can just do data dot frame and, and with x comma y that's it oh yeah give me that that's fine so y, y uh what more for y x and anything else that's it oh right? is it okay okay so okay got it so the, the order doesn't matter right it doesn't have to be x comma y you can do it. oh but one's shorter than the other hmm. Uh, with the table, you uh, but with the data frame, you could right, they could be different lengths, yes. Uh, yeah, I think can right. they? well, it's data dot frame, so this is um, is that a base? Is that a base function? Maybe comma, I think um, it's x, it's x, comma y. X comma Y, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm not sure if that's really like a deal breaker, but that's how they have it here. I don't think this is right. Um, I, these people just assign, use the assignment operator and say data dot frame X comma Y and they assign it back to like just some variable. They're not doing as dot data dot frame. It's they're using an assignment operator. So I don't know if that makes a difference. Uh, where is it? Uh, I mean, you could just use some variable name and yeah. Uh, yeah, it doesn't like it, I don't think, because it's, yeah. Yeah, so it didn't create it um, mm -hmm. because it doesn't want to do, because the two items are the wrong size. So I'm pretty sure if we do this, uh, then if, yeah, look, uh, so length of the rows. Oh, I see. I the see. length of the rows has to be the same in order to produce a data frame. So there's something wrong here with this thing, with this, because it should ha we should have the same length. Like, you know, it's like here we've created, um, let's clear that, I'll just go Y. Here we've created 100 variables, but we've only got 0, X, 1, 2, 50. Random distribution on fifty. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've got one through fifty. Mm. Isn't it? Yeah. Wait, is this right? I don't think that's right. Uh, so that should be. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. Okay. Uh, right, so let's try that again. So basically A plus B times was it random normal distribution? So
our norm, we want 50. Um, Oh, we want a hundred, don't we? So we want a hundred. Yeah. And then we want, uh, what's it? We want uh, a mean of 50. Sorry, I mean, a mean between, well, one between one and 50. But that's for the error term, but that's not what the question is because, um, because, the errors are normally distributed with the mean of zero and standard deviation three. However, the values of X, X themselves are sampled at random from a uniform distribution on the range of zero to 50. So we are supposed to simulate a hundred data points where X is sampled from zero to 50. I wonder if we need to generate a R norm of X yeah, because you're sampling X also. We need to sample, yeah, we need to sample X, don't we? So X would be, uh, what was it? X would be. Um, oh. What about sample? Uh, sample X, size 50. Uh, replacement true there you go same kind of thing uh, <laughs> um and then yeah because there we go that so that that'd be zero to 50 and then we could just add on uh yeah that's pretty smart oh is it, what was the last bit what are we doing oh i lost the page again mm. uh And then the error is normally distributed. So uh, value of X being sampled from. Hey, um, August, I'm really yeah. sorry. I'm getting some panicky emails from my boss. So I'm just going to be typing away. Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. Oof, what a mess. Um, wow, you gotta figure it out, August. Mm, it doesn't like that bit. Um, <clears throat> well, we could just say that we just call that X, uh, uh, like that, and then there we go. X times that, so X, X times that, doesn't like that, what, what's that? Oh, it doesn't like that, so let me just get X. Oh, there we go, that's it. Wait, is that right?
Actually, these questions are not seeming so terrible. I can I've just looked over up till 7.6 and it's pretty relatively easy to do thank, thanks to the discussion we had earlier about mm. the mean and how that can, the difference in mean translates to like the indicator variable regression, you know, using one indicator variable for your regression. Just, uh, okay. So now I've created 50 points. I want a hundred points. Hundred points, yeah. Wait, so, so I want I want the oh right, I see. So I don't want this the length of n instead. So that should then do that. And now we no, I don't have that right. So we want how is it I've not simulated hundred points? Oh, it's because this is fifty. So if that's fifty, then that will be fifty. But that doesn't need to be 50 because it says 1 to 50, but 100 points. So I need to sample. So sample. Oh, values of x. Yeah, so that needs to be 100. So then that needs to do that. And then we've now got 100 points. Right. Nice. Okay. Wait, I've done that wrong. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. You know, that's actually Not the right. rest of the. That's the rest of the problem set. So I'm going to say that you're, uh, if you can drop this in chat, you've already done most of the work because the rest of it is literally all the way up to 7.6 is only that, actually 7.7. .7. So except for the last three, which I don't understand and they seem very kind of up there, uh, kind of like conceptual in nature, but I think we can get up to 7.7 .7 with this. So I'm going to have to drop off now because I'm getting pinged like insanely from my office. But that is it. That is your simulation right there. So thanks for doing all the hard work. I'm not sure I quite got this right, to be honest. I, I'll uh, I'll sort it out later. Okay. Okay, sounds good. I think I, I had a really good time. I think I kind of understood what they were trying to say with the difference in means and, and all that kind of good stuff. So thank you so much. Uh, I guess we start chapter eight and we'll just play it by ear like we did this time and just keep it yeah. casual. Yeah, no yeah. worries, no worries. All right, okay. thank you so much, August, and see you, see you next oh. week. By the way, you did see the message about uh, what's it introduction? I, I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gonna be so nuts because I mean, I just have really no bandwidth at all for. I might have to just join. Are you are you thinking of joining the first cohort or like the subsequent ones? Um, I'm probably gonna join the first one on that because yeah, because you're like just dying to do it, right? And so was I, except I'm so in over my head at work and I'm teaching two classes and doing a regular full time job. I'm just like. Just yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, although I, I'm able to find time in my job in order to sometimes do uh, like 30 minutes here or there when I've got model yeah. builds going on. Um, yeah, that's the right like, way to do it, like to do it in small segments, else it's impossible mm. to get that, you know, dedicated chunk of time to get it done. Anywho, I got to go now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great week yep. and I'll catch you next week. Okay, good luck. Bye. You too. Right. See you.